in the previous lecture, we began the discussion of scattering theory. I gave you a classical overview of the classical theory, and we began setting up the formalities for the quantum theory of scattering. And we proved a result that allows us to infer that corresponding to any interacting trajectory, in the presence of some potential V, so I'm indicating the potential V here with this white blob, a spherically symmetric potential VR that satisfies a bunch of conditions. We began studying the conditions, or, or began arguing, in fact, that the, a particle moving in the presence of such a potential here will uh, will execute a trajectory that allows us to associate so-called in and out states with this non-trivial trajectory here. So this is an in state. This is an out state. And both the in state and the out state are initial states for the same system, but with it, without the potential being present. So we proved a result that allows us to associate free trajectories asymptotically with the asymptotic interacting trajectory there. We're going to take this idea and use it to build a more precise mapping between free trajectories and what I'm calling interacting trajectories because I always have in mind that we're working in relative coordinates for two particles rather than a single particle in the presence of a potential. We're going to build a precise mapping between the asymptotic interacting trajectory and an asymptotic out state. And the way we're going to build this mapping is to exploit the result from the previous lecture and the same style of argumentation to build a linear operator. So I'll get onto that right now. So as you recall, maybe I write out the result that we proved last week, uh, last lecture. So if our potential, written in terms of radial coordinates, before substituting in the position operators, If our potential satisfies these four conditions, remember they had to do with spherical symmetry, they had to do with decay of the potential at infinity and the divergence of the potential at r equals zero, and finally that the potential doesn't have too many discontinuities. So if V satisfies these conditions, then what we showed in the last lecture is that for all states psi in in our Hilbert space, which is just L2 of R3, there's a corresponding fully interacting state, if you like, which tends to the free solution asymptotically. 
that's the result we proved in the previous lecture. Well, argued. And what this tells us, this tells us something quite remarkable. It says that there is a mapping between asymptotic size and asymptotic psi ins. So I'll try and make that precise now. that in square, scare quotes, asymptote really only makes sense when you're drawing functions on a piece of paper. These are quantum states, but we'll adopt the same terminology. So the result in the white box that we argued in the previous lecture immediately gives us a relationship between psi, the actual orbit, and psi in the uh, initial state of the free trajectory. And this is just simply a rearrangement of the uh, expression in the white box. But this thing here defines an honest operator now on Hilbert space. So we'll give it a name, namely omega plus. This is a so-called Muller operator. Omega plus takes a asymptotic free trajectory and moves it onto an asymptotic interacting or actual trajectory, actual orbit. Similarly, infinitely far in the future, we have another operator defined by omega minus in this way here. You have to be very careful about operators that are defined as limits of unitary operators. Let's just give an example just to get you warmed up and to explain some of the subtleties of unitary operators. 
let's just see how remarkable this statement actually is. If we take a, both of these operators are unitary. It's the product of two unitary operators. And so this Muller operator defined implicitly by this expression here, omega plus, is the limit of some unitary operator that depends on some parameter t. The, well, just about the world's simplest unitary operator that depends on a parameter t acts on a two-dimensional Hilbert space h. And let's see why the expression in the green box is remarkable. think through this a little bit. So we take the world's simplest unitary that depends on a free parameter t. Well, not quite the simplest, right? The simplest would be for a one-dimensional Hilbert space. Let's go for the two-dimensional Hilbert space. And we ask the question, well, you know, let's just take this limit and define a Muller-type operator. Can we do it? What happens? Is this thing here remarkable, or is this just a consequence of being a unitary operator that depends on a parameter t? Well, we can write out the next line. All right. So psi is like alpha times 0 plus beta times 1. It's some state. So the, we've we got to take the limit of this operator times that state there. But that's easy. That's e to the i t 0 plus beta e to the minus i t 1. Now, what's the limit of that? Well, let's make our life even easier, right? Let's just make beta equal 0 for the moment. alpha equals 1. Okay, we have to take the limit of this, this object here. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Let's make them 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. So here, uh, states are equivalent up to a global phase, so this would have been slightly boring. Does this define an honest operator on Hilbert space? And the answer is, nope, that's right. This is a state, call it psi of t, on the Bloch sphere, what is it doing? It's executing a trajectory around the Bloch sphere as time passes. It's condemned to repeat itself over and over and over. It, it executes a great circle around the, the block sphere. It doesn't tend to anything because e to the minus i t doesn't tend to anything when you set t to infinity. e to the i t looks like the real part looks like sine wave or a, co a cosine, right? So as t goes to infinity, of a co what, does, what does cosine tend to? The answer is nothing. It doesn't, there is no limit to this function. So we can see that taking limits of unitaries that depend on parameters is subtler than just substituting in some numbers. In fact, 
for any finite dimensional unitary w of t that depends on a parameter t in a sufficiently smooth way, this limit does not exist. Miller operators do not exist in finite dimensional Hilbert space, for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. This is intrinsically an infinite dimensional object. And a generalization of this, this argument works for any finite dimensional system. You just use this recurrence theorem. So these are interesting objects, these Muller operators. One of the interesting things about them is that they are, in general, not unitary, which should sound kind of odd. You start off with a unitary, you take a limit, and then you end up with something that's not unitary. But I'll explain the non-unitary nature of these operators very soon by relating them to a to the presence of bound states in the scattering problems, the lack of unitarity. Okay. Just to make the definition clear, the actual definition. And I have some scare quotes there. Why do I have scare quotes? The difference between this thing that I wrote here and what I wrote in the previous, in the green box on the previous board was that I had a state here on the right hand side and now I took that away. This is something we do a lot in physics and you'll see it done more and more often. <laughs> 
where you take some object that only, strictly speaking, makes sense on a certain subspace of Hilbert space, its domain, and then you just take off the, the, the objects that it applies to and pretend that it's still an honest operator that you get at the end. Now, as long as the context makes it clear that you're only working on the domain of this object, then this is okay, right? You, you know, this is not a particularly good notation, but it's not particularly uh, wrong. It's just you've got to interpret the extra quantifiers that I never write out. But, you know, there are, if you took it literally as written in the, on the board, then it, it's wrong. And it's wrong because there's things called bound states. If a system has a finite dimension, a bound state that's a finite dimensional subspace of Hilbert space, then the preceding argument tells you that there's no hope that this thing could ever exist. So as long as you are careful about what the ranges and the domains are, then you'll be fine. And that's what we're about to do now. So for the moment, we put these scare quotes here to be absolutely uh, careful. First observation is that these operators are not unitary in general. They're, in fact, isometries. How would we argue that? Well, an isometry has the property that it preserves the norm of something in its domain. So we can just use the, the unitary invariance of the, the vector norm on Hilbert space to argue that Indeed, omega plus or minus applied to a state preserves its norm. And now what I'm going to do is actually draw a, a picture corresponding to how we interpret these, these, these operators. How are we to interpret these omega minus pluses or plus minuses? I'll note there's this awkward difference between plus and minus in the definition of the Muller operator. Omega plus is the limit as t goes to minus infinity. Oh, I didn't write the infinity. In there. How are we to interpret them? So I'm going to draw a picture of how to interpret these things. Right, the in asymptote is this 
trajectory here, which is never equal in general to the actual trajectory. The out asymptote is just u naught of t applied to psi out. And that's, generally speaking, never equal to the interacting trajectory. Only in the limit that t is infinity are they the same. The full trajectory is just u of t on psi. And the Miller operator is a linear operator that takes you from this psi in to the psi. So you can think of it as some operator that kind of slightly rotates you onto the, the actual trajectory. And similarly over here, the Miller operator takes you from the out trajectory, which is a free trajectory, onto the fully interacting uh, the trajectory over here. This picture captures what the Muller operators are doing. The Muller operator takes one free trajectory that asymptotically matches the actual trajectory and gives you the exact association between these two trajectories. But given that the, out, the asymptotic actual trajectory is nearer to some other free trajectory, we have to define another operator to give the association infinitely far in the future. That's why there's two Miller operators and not one. And it's this picture here that's gonna supply the intuition for everything else we're gonna construct. In the end, remember the, the limit that we care about in scattering theory is t goes to infinity and we're going to ignore everything that happens in the middle. And if you ignore everything that happens in the middle, if I, if I chop this off, then all I care about is how in asymptotes go to out asymptotes. And it turns out the Miller operators, when you put them together in just the right way, give us exactly that information and nothing more. So usually, all right, Usually we have some definite state psi in and we have some definite and we detect some definite state psi out. So I'm just setting up some notation here. And the notation that you'll typically see in the textbooks and in the literature indeed is that when you apply the Miller operator to this input free state, you just put a subscript plus. It's a convenient shorthand. So whenever you see a subscript plus, you know you're dealing with a full trajectory, 
whenever you're dealing, when you see no subscript, you're dealing with a free trajectory, an asymptotically free trajectory. That's, I changed the notation because in comma plus is too annoying to write all the time. Now I'll draw the action of the Muller operators on these states. You know, we've now got four states that we're thinking about. We're juggling phi and phi plus and chi and chi plus. And we want to see how they're all related to each other. So I'll draw a diagram for this, which parallels this diagram here. So if you like, the Miller operator takes the asymptotic free trajectory and maps you to the actual state at t equals zero of the full trajectory. It's another way of interpreting what we've, we've written so far. And in terms of our phi's and chi's, I'll put a question mark here. Should be the same thing. But let's not assume that it is yet. Actually, I don't like this depiction very much because it's suggesting that the Muller operator takes a state at t equals zero. So what I'll do is rewrite this, this slightly. I think that's safer. I prefer to write it like that. Now we have, we, I, I hope this picture down here starts to reveal some of the subtleties we're gonna have to deal with with these Miller operators. We have this free state, this asymptotic trajectory, uh, determining an asymptotic trajectory. It gets taken to a, 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 a the, asymp the uh, trajectory, the full trajectory, phi plus by this Miller operator. And similarly, we have that there for the out asymptote. The difficulty is, is do these, spa do these vectors here even live in the same part of Hilbert space? Is it the case that every free asymptotic in trajectory gets mapped to something that corresponds to a free asymptotic out trajectory? That's why I've drawn the, the picture like this with the two vectors underneath each other. Because we're now dealing with infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces and limits, none of these statements is, are obvious anymore. And that's the question that we're gonna apply ourselves now for the rest of the lecture. And already in the previous lecture, I gave you the physical background for why, what can go wrong. So things that can go wrong are an in trajectory could end up in a bound state and not even have an out trajectory. 
or an in trajectory can land in some other crazy part of Hilbert space, which is completely orthogonal to the out trajectories, but still not a bound state. All these things can happen and in fact do happen, for example, for certain example. In fact, when you see all these counterexamples, you start to wonder how scattering theory can work at all. But as is often the case with artificial counterexamples, they never apply in practice. In practice, scattering theory works tremendously well, even for situations which fall far, far, far outside of the assumptions we're making. And it's for that reason that we use it often without any rigorous proofs. We know the region where the, we know the regimes where it works, namely when these potentials satisfy these four assumptions, and we're willing to take it on faith that it, the scattering theory basically works outside of it for settings outside of those assumptions, and that's roughly the state of affairs that we're in right now. Here's the question that we want to address and by answering this question and understanding even how the answer looks for this question, we will formulate a condition. And once that condition is satisfied, then we have a well-posed scattering theory problem. And the, the fundamental question is, does every vector in Hilbert space define a trajectory, a full interacting trajectory with in and out asymptotes? Obviously the answer is no in general. I've told you this multiple times already. Let's try and separate out the space of bound states from the space of scattering states. To do this, we need to at least isolate the space of bound states. So let's give them a name. Let's call them B. B is the subspace of bound states. And it's the subspace of the full configuration Hilbert, Hilbert space. 
try and understand some other subspaces of our full configuration Hilbert space. Well, another important subspace is defined by the range of omega plus. Any state with an in asymptote is in the range of omega plus. That's what it means to have an in asymptote. Just to remind you, psi equals omega plus psi in. So psi omega plus must have mapped it to something. That's the range. The things that omega plus maps to is the range of omega plus. And let's give this space a name. That space is called R plus. The space of states in Hilbert space which are in the range of omega plus. And there's an R minus. Okay, we have three subspaces. Now we have R plus, R minus, and B. And it turns out that for the potentials that we're looking at, these very restricted class of spherically symmetric potentials that behave, roughly speaking, as 1 over r cubed and have a finite number of discontinuities, if v satisfies 0 to 3, then you can conclude, it's not so difficult to do this, that r plus is orthogonal to the bound states. And R minus is orthogonal to the bound states. And I'll go through the argument why this should be the case. In fact, you know, I want you to even think physically why would this be the case before you even attempt a, a proof. Why would it be the case that the in, uh, states with in and out asymptotes should be orthogonal to bound states? Well, let's just think through physically what we expect. So if there's a bound state, so a state in B is, is bound, that's what the word bound means, it's stuck to the potential in some fashion. So it's localized around the potential. So you think of bound states as states in Hilbert space which are, remain bounded near the potential minima for all time. So if you start with something in a, in a B in this bound state space and you, you evolve for time, what happens? Well, it doesn't just fly off. It remains near the, the center of the potential for all time. However, if you have something with an in or an out asymptote, then that's something that by de per definition will fly off as time passes. So you know, physically, it seems pretty clear that these two spaces should be different things. So let's actually argue that with an equation or two. Consider something in the range of omega plus, something with an in asymptote. 
plus applied to an in state is some state lying on a full trajectory. Let phi be a bound state, let it be an even an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, eigenstate E. And the argument will follow with a linear combination argument. Let's just consider the overlap between phi and psi. Psi is the asymptote of the full trajectory. Psi in is the asymptote of the free trajectory. What's the overlap between psi and phi? Let's have a look. Well, I'm certainly allowed to put the identity in there. That's an allowed operation at this point for all finite t. But phi is an eigenstate of h, so this is simply equal to e to the i e t of phi u t psi. But psi is in the range of the Miller operator, omega plus. And that allows us to replace u of t of psi with u naught of t of psi in, well, in the limit, right? That's why I have to put that limit there. Now we're done because. Yeah, the question. Yeah, I have to put the question why we have the same t in both cases. But there's t in zero. So the question is why do we have the same t in both cases uh, uh, here? Yeah, but uh, this t is free, right? Yeah, that's completely free, yeah. And then if we take the limit. Um, oh, goodness me, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, there's no particular reason why this should be equal to the limit, especially not with that thing in the front. That should fix it up. also wrote it equals zero, that's a bit premature. So we're going to study this limit here. <laughs> 
it's slightly awkwardly phrased. What would be nicer, I think, is if I write it instead like this. I think that's less awkwardly phrased now. We can use the fact that u of t on psi in the limit equals u naught on of t on psi in to deduce that this limit is equal to this limit. That follows from this fact here. And then we can argue that since phi is always lo localized, the right-hand limit is in fact zero. Ah, uh, minus infinity, thank you. Yeah, the left limit should be to minus infinity. Yeah, I think that's probably the nicest way to put it. And this is the way we will always do arguments in scattering theory. You know, you have this nasty thing here. That object's always hard to cope with because it means integrating the full Schrodinger equation. And you always try and find a way to express things in the limit where t is either plus or minus infinity, so that you can replace that nasty hard object with this easy thing here. And then you argue directly about this easy thing. And the nice thing about this easy thing is we've, always, we've already proved that if something, we've already proved that this, this operator diffuses any state in its range. And so anything that is initially localized is, is eventually pushed far away simply by the dynamics of a free particle and it can't stay near the phi. So everything radiates away and then this object here tends to zero in the limit. This is, an arg this is more an argument. Like to turn this into a proof, we need to be a little bit more careful, but not much more careful. This is essentially all we need to get the proof to work. So we've deduced something. We've deduced a thing called the orthogonality theorem. Now we're going to try and deduce a bit more. So this is sort of weak, right? We know that scattering states are not bound states. Is there anything else between scattering states and bound states? Are there exotic states which are not scattering but not bound? It's infinite dimensions. Everything fits in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Who knows what's in there, what's hiding in there? So in the orderly, in an orderly, well-behaved, universe, you might expect that states that don't scatter must per, per definition be stuck on the center of the potential. I think that feels intuitively correct, right? You know, if you throw some things together, then either they stick or they bounce. But there's always the possibility that something crazy might happen, right? That they don't, that an in trajectory comes in to the scattering target sort of spirals in, then spirals out, then spirals in again, then spirals out, and never quite gets bound, because it spirals out further and further each time and spirals back in, but then never quite hits a free trajectory. It never quite spirals fully away. And actually, that's the kind of things you might expect from potentials with singular continuous spectra. It's not totally ridiculous to, to, to imagine that these things could happen. So there are, it's, po it's very well possible that there's parts of Hilbert space which are neither bound nor scattering. But that would be quite inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> 
So a physicist's way of dealing this, with this might be simply to say, okay, those exotic states, they're not stable. Right? They're, they're, you can never get on them. That's one way out of it. Another way out of it is simply define them away. Just say, no, we don't want them. Let's define them completely away, these exotic states which spiral in and spiral out and spiral in further and further. There it is, we're gonna define them away. There are no exotic states anymore. Here's the definition. A state, a scattering theory is said to be asymptotically complete if Firstly, all the states with an in asymptote are precisely the states with an out asymptote. The condition number part one, if you like. And furthermore, they are equal to all states which are orthogonal to bound states. So there's nothing in between. So this space here is R, and that's equal to is, is the ortho complement of the space of bound states. And that, another way of saying it is that Hilbert space is comprised of bound states and scattering states, and that's it. There's no exotic states. Yo, question? Quick question. Um, don't we have states that uh, has a, a particle comes in and then becomes bounded? Don't we have states where the particle comes in and becomes bounded? For example, um, in a counter space, uh, where we have a bounded state that becomes... Uh, alpha decay? Yeah, yeah, for example, alpha decay. Yes, absolutely, this happens. That theory is not asymptotically complete. Okay. So we're talking about the best of worlds here, where not even this happens that a state can come in and become bounded or a bound state can become excited. We have a very uh, sterile definition here. Question is, does this match anything in nature? Do, do we have a hope that this, has, this matches something? Does this capture scattering theory? Already alpha decay is, is a certain sign that maybe... That doesn't stop it being a useful definition. Because it actually does, it is not empty, it's not vacuous. We can make the, we're free to make the definition, it might just not apply to any interesting example. It actually does apply to some examples. And the examples that it applies to are precisely the potentials that satisfy our conditions zero to three. So the proof, hmm, 
I think there's only two words which could describe the proof of this theorem. Very difficult. So there is a proof that a scattering theory uh, that defined by a potential satisfying condition 0 to 3 is asymptotically complete in a sense, but it's a very difficult proof. Extremely long, extremely complicated, very difficult. There's no other way to say it. You're invited to look it up in Reed and Simon, Volume 3. But I won't cover it here in this course. So it's a restrictive definition, asymptotic completeness. It's a restrictive condition. But it's very useful to set up the problem for us and then to study from the, the perspective of the problem that we set up with, according to the asymptotic completeness definition, we can study deviations, systems which don't obey asymptotic completeness. So for the moment, let's assume that our theory obeys asymptotic completeness. Then, well, for every psi in R, the scattering states, ut of psi describes a scattering experiment. And because r equals r plus equals r minus, we actually know that as t tends to minus infinity, that u of t asymptotes to some input state, psi in, and that as t tends to plus infinity, you know, finally, thanks to this asymptotic completeness condition, we can infer that u of t or psi also tends to an asymptotic out state. Which means that psi, according to the definition of the Miller operator, equals omega plus times psi in and equals omega minus on psi out. This is the crucial line here. Psi is in the range of omega plus on an input state and it's in the range of omega minus on an output state. We're almost ready to define the object that we need, the core object of scattering theory. This is the object that will be of central interest to you if you study high energy physics at any level, if you study dilute gases at any level, if you study uh, quantum gravity at any level. The object we're about to define is the core observable for all of physics that concerns particles moving in dilute environments. <laughs> 
So I'm going to draw a schematic of what's going on here. You have some, uh, this line here represents full Hilbert space. That's, you know, a projected infinite dimensional Hilbert space onto one dimension. Omega plus is some linear operator on this Hilbert space. We know that Hilbert space is really the direct sum of bound states and scattering, uh, and scattering states. So I'm going to denote that as two linear spaces direct sum together. This is R up here. This is B down there. So omega plus takes psi into just the scattering states to some psi. And similarly over here, H, some out state gets mapped by omega minus also onto this space here, the R. But because omega is an isometry, we can find an operator, omega minus dagger, which goes the other way. This looks innocuous enough, I suppose. Now, why would we want to do this? Well, the answer is that we can go from thinking just uh, about in to out states to thinking about just out to out states or in to in states just by using this, the daggers of these Miller operators. And it's usually nice to have an operator which acts on the same space, right? So the core complaint you might have about a Miller operator is it's not something you can really ever observe. It takes an asymptotic input trajectory. That's something you could imagine doing. You could imagine preparing a system asymptotically far away from the scattering target, letting it fly. And then it does its thing, right? So the Miller operator t tells you how to associate asymptotic input-free trajectories with asymptotic full trajectories. But that's not really something you can observe, because then you have to somehow observe the full trajectory to actually observe the Muller operator. So all along, these Muller operators were just a way to construct something that we can observe. And this is where we come now to the most important observable, dare I say it, in all of physics. It's not really the most important observable in all the physics. Thermodynamic quantities are the most important observables in all the physics. Temperature, entropy, pressure. Those are, the, those are really important. But this is almost the most important observable in all the physics. All right, these guys are isometric, right? So. We're going to combine them to build an operator that acts on from the same space to the same space. So if you have a state psi, that's the image of some out state, then that tells us that psi out is the image of the adjoint of the full state. But also, psi out is the image of another operator, right? Namely, plus. And I'll do it the other way around. 
Psi is omega plus on psi in. Psi out is omega minus dagger on psi. And with that, we've constructed the scattering operator. The scattering operator conveniently forgets all about the full trajectory. The scattering operator just tells you how asymptotic in states get mapped to asymptotic out states. And it doesn't tell you anything more. That's all it has in it. it. It's made good on our promise that we want to ignore everything that happens at intermediate times. It is the data that we can collect from a scattering experiment when we only have access to large times. And it turns out that even though it, it's a unitary operator, as we'll see in the next lecture, it's unobservable in the sense that we can reconstruct it from experiments. So it's operationally defined. And it's, the, it's an operator who tells you just enough about your system that you can argue about how it behaves, even in the presence of many particles. So I've just defined this operator in, in the case of two identical, well not identical, but just two particles in relative coordinates or just a single particle with a scattering potential. The S matrix has a natural generalization to many particle scattering. We won't be covering many particle scattering in this course. but be assured that there is a way to generalize these concepts. So let me see if I have time to say anything about the S matrix. I guess I'll quote the most important property of the S matrix and then leave the proof to the next lecture. The most important property that the S matrix satisfies is the conservation of energy. This is really a crucial property. And one will argue in the next lecture.
this, these statements we'll discuss in the next lecture, but in short, the S matrix conserves energy. It doesn't conserve the energy of the full interacting system because it has nothing to do with the full interacting system. The S matrix is just the way to associate trajectories of the free system with output trajectories, also in the free system. It's not a priori obvious that such an association would ever conserve energy of the free system, but it does. So this is one of the most crucial properties of the S matrix. And it's a consequence of this intertwining relation here. And the intertwining relation says that if you take a in state to a full trajectory and work out its energy, then that's the same as working at the energy of the free state and then taking it to the full trajectory. We'll discuss these topics in the next lecture, but we don't have time, no. I don't think so. We won't have time to, to do that today. Okay, I think we will stop there. Thank you very much.